Good afternoon. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I'm Ken Lambertz. I'm the Vice Chancellor of the University of Sheffield. And it's a great pleasure um, for me to be here today for the launch, the launch of the Research and Research Institute. Um, first of all, I, I want to tell you that I'm, of course, really proud that the University of Sheffield is one of the four founding partners um, leading this very important piece of work. And I'd like to take the opportunity to congratulate James Wilsden um, from Sheffield, who is the director of the Institute, and of course everybody else who's involved in the very hard work um, to get us to this launch today. Um, we're extremely grateful to the Wellcome Trust and Digital Science for, for their support and for the opportunity to work in what, what will promise to be a, a very innovative and, and I think applied way. Um, the Institute, the proposal for the Institute look fantastic. It brings together an international consortium of, of funders, of technologists and data providers. And, and as you know, it's going to champion the latest approaches to, to this rapidly growing field of interdisciplinary research on research. Um, I think it's an example of, of co-designed interdisciplinary research at, at its very best. And I'm, I'm really excited, as I'm sure are all of us, to see what it, what it will produce. Um, as, as I'm sure you will know, across the higher education community and across the research community, there is more focus than ever on um, career paths, on sustainability of different trajectories, on precarity in, in the workforce, and on diversity. And, and that combined with very strong focus on, on, on the value of, of research careers, um, the value and, and, and the impact that skilled researchers bring to our economy and to society. That raises a number of very important questions, I think. And um, this session is going to explore how research on research can, can inform and support inclusive and interdisciplinary careers. And the focus will also be on, on how we measure, how we evaluate, and how we reward performance against what is potentially a very rich, very diverse set of criteria and indicators that might all have behavioral and, and career um, implications for those who are subjected to them. So we have some fantastic speakers on the panel. We're going to hear first from Professor James Evans, who is director of the, the Knowledge Lab at the University of Chicago. And he is going to give us an overview of some of the key um, issues. We'll then hear three snapshot talks, each of which is an example of, of, of a current and excited, exciting piece of research on these topics. Um, first will be by Dr. Sally Hancock, who is a lecturer in education at the University of York, followed by Professor Megan McGarvey, who is an associate professor of markets, public policy, and law at Boston University, um, followed by Dr. Kolya Bridis, who is a senior researcher on the careers of PhD holders project at DZHW, which is the German center for higher education research and science studies. Finally, we'll then benefit from a few reflections from our discussant, and that's Dame Atin Donald, at the far end of the table. Who, Atin is Master of Churchill College at the University of Cambridge, and, and she is a leading voice um, in debates about equality and diversity in research. So I'm sure these talks will, will of course, prompt lots of questions from, from you as well. Um, there will be an opportunity to ask questions, but, but can I please ask that you hold on to those until we've heard everybody at the end of the talks. And then if, if we all stick to our allotted time, which I will try to make sure happens, then we should, should have about 20 minutes for discussion. So um, let's now begin with James Evans. James, over to you. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm really excited about this initiative, and, and uh, I'm uh, grateful to kind of talk about, I would say, certainly not a panorama over the entire range of possible career issues, but some of the things that we've done uh, at Knowledge Lab that kind of intersect with these ideas of, of career and how they influence science as a whole. So I'm going to be talking about the science um, of science and its intersection with the importance of diverse and persistent careers for discovery. Uh, in science and technology. So uh, as was mentioned earlier, I run a, a center called 
uh, Knowledge Lab, which is focused on large-scale data, machine learning, and intelligent crowdsourcing to represent large-scale knowledge and careers, to understand them, which is to say do a large-scale science studies, and then transform the scientific and scholarly process by using heuristics and biases of the system to, to redirect uh, research. And so here, our question really is about how it is that science as a system uh, thinks. Uh, and, uh, and we've been talking about this and, and have had a number of uh, pieces in science uh, and nature over the past, uh, you know, uh, 10 years really kind of thinking and trying to articulate um, how to think about research and research as a, as a process going forward. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think our broader uh, intuition is, is the same as those who have talked earlier, uh, that economic growth, that human flourishing ends up relying in deep ways on the um, on scientific discovery and technological uh, innovation. And I see science and technology as, um, as speakers in the last section, as a deeply complex system with multiple components tightly coupled. They're emergent phenomena that result. Scientific careers are a critical part of that. They interact with the instruments and methods and education they receive, the scientific concepts that they interact with, and the societal problems that they apply themselves to. Uh, and in particular, I'm gonna talk about how overlapping careers uh, and connections uh, can potentially limit and distort collective understanding and how to think about designing policies that, that can do better. Uh, and this uh, is underlined by uh, this, uh, a piece that we published uh, a little less than a year ago on the social structure of disagreement. So in PLOS One, a journal whose um, ostensible research criteria or uh, is, is not the, uh, the significance of the research, it's only the validity of the research, it turns out that reviewers agree no more on the likelihood of publication than on anything else, which is to say about the same level as a Rorschach test, the inkblot test, it's about 0.19 is the correlation between reviewers who believe that something is accurate, not that it's good or not good, uh, and these end up being correlated super linearly with the distance of authors from others in this large, uh, expansive co-authorship network, which is to say the people who are close to one another think that the work that's around them is good and that the work that's distant from them is, is bad, on average. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about this in, in three chapters. One, that centralized communities generate less le replicable results. And I would think about this in terms of careers as tightly braided careers end up generating these centralized communities. Um, large teams develop science and technology, but small teams disrupt it. So thickly braided careers produce things that um, are expected uh, additions to uh, the past rather than radical disruptions or deviations from it. And that scaling the rugged landscape of science and technology requires a kind of entanglement of careers. Uh, and we need to think about building policies that make that possible. So tightly braided careers, dense, Centralized communities generate less, repl less replicable results. Um, so people speak of a replication crisis. I think uh, the replication crisis is really just a focus of attention to replication that has really come as a result of, of a maturation of the science of science and research on research communities, which is exciting. Uh, it really has kind of blossomed in genetics and, and psychology, but it's also kind of finding its way, probing its way into other areas. Um, we take a kind of a high throughput strategy to, to conceptual replication and reproducibility by taking published claims. So this is a, a paper we published recently in eLife. We take about 70,000 published claims on drug gene interactions and we align them with high throughput experiments, right, which are basically performed independent of the kind of incentives that individual scientists are uh, put to. Uh, and, and these high throughput experiments are performed about 200 replications per experiment across biological variation and, and uh, uh, experimental variation. Uh, and what we find is that in biomedical research that uh, agreement does predict robustness. When there are more papers that make a certain claim, uh, then it's more likely basically for the high throughput experiments to validate or confirm that claim. And on the converse, when there's more biological variation in the high throughput experience, experiments, it's more likely for people to disagree about those claims. But we explode each of the 50,000 communities uh, into all of the researchers, all the methods, and all of the prior research that they build on, and we find dense connections and centralization in those knowledge sources. It dramatically decreases robustness. When I say dramatically, I mean all of the benefit of accumulation across those papers disappears as a function of network communities that are producing these claims. So it's a, this is a bubble, this is an echo chamber, right, in the context of science, which is invisible in some sense to those who are reading the science without 
basically doing this kind of networking exercise. Um, so social connection through these careers, intense careers and collaboration, limits collective understanding in a way that's deeply uh, measurable and replicable. We've also looked at this in the context of gene-gene interactions, and we do the Bayesian trick of flipping it around, saying, okay, well, if we can understand the degree to which there are features uh, that uh, predict the likelihood that a claim, a particular claim is true, can we identify as a function across all claims, the likelihood that these are, are true. And, and it turns out that we can do much, much better than random, much, much better than just reading the research, much, much better than just reading science or nature papers uh, by looking uh, at the, the, these features, basically, of the community that increases the likelihood that, that work replicates uh, and away from things that, uh, that decrease that likelihood. Um, we've also been looking at the, oh, and, and it turns out this also has really deep implications for policy. So for example, uh, and it, you can directly see the likelihood that you fund um, a second group, right? Uh, a second metric, uh, a second research uh, team that's focused on the same question dramatically increases the likelihood that those findings will be robust uh, in future research. Also, if you spread out that research attention across a wide range of questions, then you dramatically increase the likelihood that you can predict the future, that you basically develop science that's replicable and deep as a function of attention basically to careers. So chapter two, uh, we're interested in looking at you know, how it is that thickly braided careers or large scale overlapping teams uh, develop and small teams uh, disrupt. So big teams are kind of uh, erupting everywhere uh, in science and technology and the humanities uh, re really everywhere. Um, one example is the uh, 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics, about 1,069 authors on the paper, uh, contrasts with the one uh, author on the paper that produced the hypothesis 100 years before and the single author teams that basically tried to identify similar effects. This is the gravitational wave uh, uh, detection. So we were interested in looking at the degree to which these kind of large overlapping careers in the context of large teams ended up correlating with the likelihood of kind of problem creation, exploration, subversion, people have talked about this for years, versus solution, exploitation, succession, basically marginal uh, contributions to the status quo. So we looked at this across science, technology, across software development, uh, about 70 million uh, research projects over the last 100 years. And we looked at disruption as a function of the likelihood that you eclipse the work on which you build, right? Basically, when people tell stories about your work in the future, they ignore everything else that's gone before. If they see it as a new research direction, they basically retell the story with your incremental kind of like grain to the sand pile if they didn't. And it turns out that you get all of this beautiful semantic structure for free, uh, right? So uh, the things that are more likely to develop, endorse, confirm, and demonstrate, while those that disrupt, change, introduce, and advance, et cetera, right? But we didn't, we didn't build the measure to do that. It just does that. Uh, and so we kind of like look through all of these millions and millions of cases in terms of the likelihood to disrupt, that they'll just focus on this new thing versus uh, develop, and we find that basically across uh, articles, patents, and software, that there's this exponential decline with every additional team member of, of disrupting, basically. It dramatically increases the likelihood, and it, it doesn't matter where you slice this distribution, right? Uh, uh, what's a small team? It doesn't matter where you slice that distribution either, you know, but the difference between 19 and 20 is identifiable as the difference between one and two. It's an exponential decline, so the difference between one and two is bigger. Uh, but these are highly identifiable, and it's true across all times and places that we looked at. Uh, what's interesting is about 70% of the effect is within person and topic, right? So we did a, did a huge neural embedding of all the topics, and we identified the same person, the same class of research project, add one additional team member, and it decreases uh, proportionally that likelihood that they'll disrupt. Um, it turns out that the search mechanisms are different as well. So basically, large teams are like huge production houses in the context of the film industry. Like, it, you know, if, if, a, you know, if a big filmmaker is gonna decide between you know, producing Slumdog Millionaire or Transformers 9, what are they gonna decide? You know, it's like Transformers 9, right? Because it's gonna bring Transformers 8 receipts minus Epsilon. I mean, that's, that's the, uh, and, and that's what happens. You know, large scale teams systematically are looking for yesterday's hits. They basically hedge their bets and their risks because uh, the funding is larger. And as a result, 
um, their impact happens immediately. So the Human Genome Project is one classic example where they, they timed, perfectly timed, you know, at, d before, sufficiently before the holidays, but close enough to the holidays to avoid competing news. Uh, and, uh, and I think it, it, you know, benefited and harmed, in some sense, the publicity of the project. It all happened immediately, but the publicity did not last. Um, so why is this? Well, there's certainly more to gain and less to lose for small teams versus large teams. Um, it's also that, uh, and this is where careers uh, intersect with this, small teams tend to be like mesas. They're flat. People contribute equally across the project. Large teams are much more like pyramids uh, where you've got a single brain uh, who's designing the project at the center and many muscles at the periphery. And it turns out that if you just take that brain to muscle ratio, forgive the uh, banality of the metaphor, you end up capturing the same effect uh, in the system. Um, so uh, other work that we've done, uh, you know, shows that flocking, uh, flocking, and so think about this in terms of the correlation of careers and educations, ends up dramatically slowing future understanding. So slowing the speed by which the community can achieve even just what has been achieved, what has been published, right? So these are probabilistic models where we kind of identify what it is that the community does, and then we search through that space of models and identify what they could have done, how, they, how fast they could have achieved that with a different logic. Um, and I think, you know, the underlying idea is really just that social connection uh, leads to kind of cultural, and in this context, intellectual collapse. Uh, this is kind of a simple information theory kind of cartoon that basically as mutual information rises between two random variables, two random researchers, then the joint entropy between them falls, right? The, the, the space of ideas that can converse over and dispute and generate falls. And, and we, we do this in the context of 21st century physics. We project all of basically the physics collaborations down to this this hyperbolic disk and we project all of the subjects that they study and basically as they collaborate more, it's, it's dramatically and, and proportionally associated with the decline in the relative topics that are studied and the answers that are found. So this is associated with a broader success paradox where as fields grow, they're associated with this exponential decline in the likelihood that the new work will enter the canon of the old. Right, uh, and so you end up having these huge fields, which are like trusts, effectively, which you know conserve uh, ideas and commitments from the past. So, the underlying issue and idea here is, you know, is science and technology smooth? Is it a smooth space? We kind of know what we know, and like the next step is the next closest step, or is it a rugged space? So if if it's a smooth space, the network communities and large-scale teams and thickly braided careers, tightly braided careers, uh, will be the most successful approach. They'll, tight, they'll hill climb, essentially, up this, this community. If it's not, if it's a rugged landscape, then individuals and small teams um, scatter and are much more likely to identify uh, this possible frontier. Uh, just a little work that suggests that it's seemingly smooth. We built uh, a little model recently in a project under review that basically shows um, that you can predict about 95 to 97% of next year's papers and patents as a function of just the situation of all those elements in some uh, higher semantic space. It suggests that basically researchers are randomly walking through this space of things that are familiar and close to their own interests. But um, it's definitively complex in that if you, the best predictor of the things that will be hits in the future, so we can predict 50% of the likelihood that you'll be in the top 10% of citations and patents and papers just as a function of unpredictability under the most predictable model, right? So basically, you know, the, the careers that really deviate, and in fact, if we think about, well, how does a system think as a whole? Well, it, the system could deduce things from prior work, it could induce things from, from uh, current work, or it could abduce things, which is basically where you have expectations and they collide with new findings. And we find, uh, and what this would suggest is basically that that discovery occurs in conversation with outsiders, with aliens from those communities, that that's precisely the case. So 70% of that predictability, right, of, of things which are, are going to achieve uh, high success is a function of what we call audience novelty. Basically, when a group from one community, from one part of the research space, travels over uniquely to another space and solves their problem. So they engage an audience that has never been engaged with that expertise uh, before. Um, so that's diversity. Persistence, uh, this is a piece that's, uh, that's forthcoming, uh, which, um, in which we basically look at, at, at grant funding and startups and other cases, and we look at 
basically the effect of persistence in the likelihood that a sequence of failures will lead to success, and we find a really strong discriminator, which is the likelihood that you, that you actually persist, that you learn from a sequence of past failures dramatically increases the likelihood that you'll eventually succeed. And we can tell that after a single failure attempt and, uh, and uh, reattempt. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is uh, modernity, right? That we're all hyper-connected, uh, you know, I mean, it, like, do we need to roll back the internet and, the, uh, and, and email uh, and other connections uh, that we have? The answer is partly yes. <laughs> you know, um, can we re-engineer scientific careers to increase collective imagination? Well, there are many kinds of solutions. Some are competition policies that we can think about, so breaking up big trusts, funding marginal uh, groups and approaches. Another is a pluralism policy where we explicitly focus on alternative approaches. Um, I think you know, we can really expand our way of our method of portfolio thinking where we, we really become more comfortable with risk and failure to maximize the outside success. We can also think about the institutions of science to, to not just the demand for surprise and, and uh, uh, generation, but the supply, right? In education for discovery, every student becomes an experiment. Right? Uh, every student becomes somebody that we're basically searching through this possible space of uh, futures to identify uh, discovery. And uh, where humans can't go, we can send robots. Uh, not the most human robots, but the most alien robots. The, the, the robots that basically aren't subject to the kinds of pressures that we're subject to. So the final uh, message is that for the evolution of sustainable innovation, we, we've often talked about promoting bridging between disciplines. We also need to talk about protecting and growing independence, growing difference, because ubiquitous connection uh, and thickly braided careers uh, basically leads to crystallizing and killing uh, collective understanding. So uh, with that, I'll close. Thank you. Thanks very much, James. On to Sally. Okay, uh, good afternoon. So my name is Sally Hancock. I'm from the University of York. Um, and the focus of my uh, snapshot is going to be PhD pathways in the UK. Now in terms of policy, in the UK we see many of the same trends as we do elsewhere. Successive UK governments have pledged to increase the number of PhD students and to support their transition into non-academic employment. As we have heard, these ambitions are often rooted in commitments to developing knowledge-based economies. And within this vision, PhD holders represent human capital of the highest possible value, their prize for their ability to innovate, to problem solve, and to disseminate knowledge. Now, if we look at the data on UK universities awarding PhDs, we see that um, the number of awards to UK domicile PhDs, and that's the dark black color, has been quite consistent since around 2012, around 12,000 PhDs awarded per year. Most of the growth in PhDs awarded over this time has been to non-EU international students. And in light of that, we've seen interventions from the UK government to stimulate domestic demand in PhDs. We now have loans for master's degrees and PhDs. So this is a picture that may soon change, and of course will have implications for employment destinations. We also see commitment to the knowledge economy through successive uh, investment in transferable skills programs, which for the last 15 years or so have um, de been designed to support PhDs into non-academic employment and to support these researchers to become sector-shifting knowledge agents. Together, these investments make it ever important to understand the returns to doctoral study. Now, although the growth in UK domicile PhDs hasn't been at the same scale as some other countries, such as China and Australia, the UK scientific community is no less concerned with the question of whether we are producing too many PhDs, whether growth is sustainable, and whether we might, in the words of Professor Paula Stephen, resort to PhD birth control. <coughs> Even at present levels, and this is... Um, employment data, it's a snapshot taken three and a half years um, after graduation for UK PhDs only, we see that the number of PhDs being awarded far outnumbers the academic openings. Around 70% of PhDs across all fields will have left academia after three and a half years. 
If we look at uh, those who stay in academia, we see that roughly two-thirds are um, involved in teaching and research, and around one-third are in research only. And if we look at those who leave academia, we see roughly a 50-50 split in terms of those who continue to be research active and those who no longer do research. But an understanding PhD employment pathways is complex, and we are particularly challenged in the UK by the data we currently have, which is a point I'll return to. A number of qualitative studies with UK PhDs and postdocs suggest that the majority begin their programme considerably under-informed about longer-term career prospects, and that planning for non-academic careers comes quite late into the PhD or even the postdoc. The realisation that an academic job may not be waiting at the end of the process is often characterised in this research as a difficult and isolating experience and reinforces perceptions of the hyper-competitive nature of academia. Research commissioned by the Wellcome Trust in 2013 suggested that female PhD holders are particularly susceptible to this view and more likely to leave academia early as a result. Also, reports of the relatively poor mental health of PhDs and postdocs has been attributed to these issues of an oversaturated academic job market, rising employment precarity, and pressures to publish and secure funding. <coughs> now, we do know in the UK that PhD employment outcomes differ considerably by PhD holders' characteristics. The effect of discipline is significant in explaining almost all destinations here in the dark blue, we see proportions that stay in academia. This is unsurprising given the very different numbers of PhDs awarded in these fields. Doctoral institution, i.e. whether your PhD came from a Russell group or not, and prior qualifications, whether you hold a taught master's degree, are also significant in increasing the probability of entering academic employment. If we look conversely at those who um, leave academia but manage to secure research work, we see the significant effects of institution, again, Russell Group, doctoral subject, holding a STEM PhD, prior qualification, holding a taught master's, and also gender, i.e. male PhDs. They're all significantly higher um, in likelihood of securing research work on leaving academia. Qualitative research can shed some light on these observations. Uh, my colleague Paul Wakeling has done qualitative research with PhDs and shown that opportunities and experiences vary considerably by university type, i.e. institutional prestige and the level of research income and culture. These insights, of course, raise important questions for social justice and have considerable implications for the diversity of the future research workforce and the knowledge produced by it. Now, everything I've said so far represents only about one quarter of possible knowledge. This is all that the models we have explain for. Put another way, around three quarters of all of the variants in PhD pathways is unexplained by the data we have. We also have very little understanding of why these destinations unfold as they do. So I'd like to close with a few suggestions um, for future research priorities on PhD pathways. Firstly, and this is very much the subject of the working paper published this morning with Paul Wakeling and Jen Chubb, we need much better methods of um, exploring doctor doctoral access, experiences and outcomes. This is particularly important if further PhD expansion is planned and part of the cost of this expansion is going to be transferred to students through a loan system which promises employment premiums. We need data that are genuinely longitudinal, which extend beyond the three and a half years we currently have, which address access to the doctorate linked to prior aspirations, <coughs> career planning, circumstances of the PhD, and full employment history. We need to systematically link to data on the demographic <coughs> variables that are known to affect access to higher study and employment outcomes more broadly. And this includes prior attainment, higher education institutions beyond Russell Group, non-Russell Group, and social class origin, which is absent for over 90% of our PhD holders in the employment data. Finally, we need richer dating data on decision-making and context. In other words, how do capitals, opportunities, and barriers, perceived or otherwise, shape career pathways? We need to better understand who benefits from doctoral study and why. Where possible, we should be following best practice internationally, developing a programme of research 
which closely aligns to that of other scientific nations. Germany, which we'll hear about um, in a moment, the Netherlands, Australia, and the US. And we should work towards an internationally comparative data set, which will help us understand research and mobility and career pathways across a global context. Thank you. Over to Megan, please. So thank you very much. Um, it's an honor to be here at the launch of this uh, exciting initiative. And I want to thank Sally for <laughs> his, uh, introducing the topic of my pr uh, presentation, which is about international mobility among uh, STEM PhDs. And I should say that uh, all of the research I'm going to talk about today is uh, collaborative work with my colleague, Shubhani Khan. So the starting point for our research comes from the fact that um, in the United States STEM workforce, a uh, very large share of uh, all workers, but especially those with, a doctor with doctoral training, uh, are foreign born. And this, we saw this also in uh, Sally's presentation. Um, and the percentage has been rising over time. Um, and, the, and these workers tend to be in fields that have relatively few US citizens, but very high value to the economy, computer science, engineering, physics, and so on. Um, however, recently, there is some indication that uh, more of these students are returning to their home countries, uh, <laughs> particularly students from China and India. And this raises the question of why um, and what the implications of this will be for the US economy um, and for uh, all countries uh, you know, who rely on large numbers of foreign students, um, as well as the home countries of uh, these students. So our research has focused on two broad questions. One is how policy affects mobility, particularly immigration policy. And secondly, what are the impacts of individual scientist mobility on scientific progress and innovation? So let me first talk about the effects of policy on mobility. So I'm going to highlight some recent research that uh, Shu and I have done, which looks at uh, delays in obtaining permanent residency for Chinese and Indian applicants in the United States. So um, the US has a system in which the number of uh, permanent residency visas are um, capped at a, a, a certain number, and that number is constant across all countries of applicants. So because China and India are so populous and there are many more applicants from these countries, this has resulted in very long queues and very long wait times for permanent residency with the implications of uh, reduced mobility, reduced job mobility, lower wages, unemployment among spouses during certain periods of our sample, and just overall uncertainty for applicants for permanent residency in the United States. What we see in our data, which comes from the National Science Foundation's survey of uh, earned doctorates, uh, sorry, do survey of doctoral recipients, which is that um, we see that uh, prior to about 2005, 2006, Chinese and Indian uh, STEM doctorates had about a 40 percentage point higher stay rate in the United States. However, around the same time that these uh, delays for uh, uh, permanent residency were introduced, we started to see that stay rate decline, and it's gone down by about 1.7 percentage points for each additional year of delay or each additional year of waiting time for permanent residency. So you might say, well, okay, maybe these people who are going back to their home countries are the ones who had the kind of worst job opportunities in the United States, and so maybe the loss to the US is not as big as this might seem. But if you look at the distribution across um, program rank, so it's kind of how, how highly ranked are the PhD programs from which these people are uh, graduating, it looks like the uh, distribution of program rank among returnees is shifted towards the higher quality institution or the higher ranked institutions, <coughs> which suggests that there may, this may be uh, a source of concern for um, the US economy. Uh, turning to what are the impacts of mobility, um, the first thing that we'll look at is um, the, what, what Chinese uh, scientists are doing when they go back to China. So this is a new project. Um, that we're, where we're looking at um, salaries and research activities among Chinese returnees. So there's, we have a, a quite a, a striking finding, which is that among Chinese doctoral recipients from US programs, those who go back to China, <laughs> among those who go back to China, four, nearly 40% of them are involved in basic research, and if we combine basic and applied research, it's 60%. Compare that to those who remain in the US, only 20% are involved in basic research, and most are involved in more technical uh, types of activities. 
Uh, if we look at other low and high income countries or US citizens who remain in the United States, um, there's no comparison in terms of the percentage who are involved in uh, basic research. So I think this raises the question of, you know, what are the impacts of this on um, publications? Unfortunately, we don't have publication data in this particular study, but we have some other work that we've done in the past which looked at how location affects productivity and knowledge sharing among scientists who go back to their home countries. So um, this was a, a project in which we looked at recipients of the Foreign Fulbright Fellowship who come to US universities and we matched them to a set of foreign born PhD recipients from the same programs who were not funded by the fo Foreign Fulbright Program. And those with the Foreign Fulbright Fellowship were twice as likely to return home to their home countries. Most of them were not from China and India, but they were from a range of other countries and other scientific fields. So they're twice as likely to re return home because of the nature of the visa that they're given, which requires them to do that. Those who go back to lower income countries, so for example, a country at the 50th percentile of GDP per capita, would have 34% fewer publications, but 64% fewer citations and 59% fewer last authored publications. We don't observe similar effects on uh, productivity and uh, uh, basically on productivity for Fulbrights from high income countries. However, all Fulbrights, low income, high income, have uh, sig substantially more collaborations with scientists in their home country. So we, then we looked at knowledge diffusion as measured by citations, and there we find that um, Fulbright Fellows, especially those who go back to lower income or countries with a weaker science base, are much more highly cited. Their research is much more highly cited in their home country, and they cite research in the home country much more, suggesting that despite the reduction in productivity uh, measured by total publications, there's much more knowledge sharing going on through this uh, mobility channel. So uh, this question, you know, as always, this research raises many more questions than it answers, and let me just highlight some of those uh, questions. So, you know, first of all, um, publications, citations, as was mentioned this morning repeatedly, they don't capture the full uh, picture of the impact of returning on home country science. So we'd love to have more data on other impacts, uh, the broader impacts of uh, returnees on home countries. Um, secondly, what are the programs and policies that would promote continued knowledge exchange um, between returnees who go back to their home countries and the institutions that train them and researchers that they were connected to in the training country, in our case, the United States, but I think this is relevant across all trained countries that host uh, foreign students. And then, you know, given that people are going back to their home countries, what can, what programs and policies promote uh, continued productivity among uh, returnees? Um, to answer these questions, we need rich data, we need new data, we need uh, data on a counterfactual, what would have happened if you know, the person hadn't gone back to their home country or what would have happened under alternative scenarios, and we need data that give us in the whole ecosystem of funding, um, not just one funder but multiple uh, funders. We need to know about both potential applicants as well as those who received grants, um, broad range of outcomes, and multiple measures of impact. So um, that's it for my remarks, and I hope to have conversations about this with uh, all of you over lunch. Thank you. Okay, so good morning, everybody, also from my side. Thank you for inviting me to this very wonderful day and uh, um, also for the session. Um, First of all, I have to say I'm a little bit afraid of this uh, traffic light because I'm German <laughs> and you know when it turns red, everybody's going to stop. Um, but anyhow, um, I'm, I was asked to, to talk uh, about some projects we are doing at our institute, the German Center for Higher Education and Science Studies. Um, and uh, I'm going to just tell you something about how we are approaching the career pathways of PhD students and PhD holders. Um, and therefore, I, I will start with first study, um, which is on uh, PhD holders. We started that study some five years ago now, in 2014. Uh, we started in 2013, but the first wave took place in 2014. Um, it was a um, panel, or it is a panel study on PhD holders. Um, we contacted all graduates from the year of 2014 in Germany. Um, well, we didn't 
really succeed because we contacted nearly 20,000 and we had 27,000 in that year. Um, and uh, one quarter of them took part in the first wave and afterwards you can see um, we, we had some further waves which are still ongoing so we um, now are going to prepare the sixth wave in the, in the, for the next year. <laughs> Um, and you can see just the partition rate, uh, rates we have. And what I want to do is just to show you some results from, from that study before I'll continue with the next study. Um, here's, here's a slide showing um, how many people are working in the different areas um, after the PhD. Um, and what you can see is uh, it's nearly the same like in the UK. Um, uh, about 30% are starting in, in academic sector after after the PhD, and uh, numbers or percentages are decreasing a little bit, not but not that much within the first years. Um, but on the other hand, we have a lot of persons who are leaving the academic sector and also are not working in research and development in the industry, for example. Um, and this, of course, also raises the question sometimes. Um, do we have too much PhD candidates or PhD holders? What, what are they doing? And this is one of the questions we have to work on in the future, um, especially in Germany, to understand what are people doing when they are not working in research, either academic research or industrial research, um, because there might be a benefit of the PhD as well, um, even if they are not closely related to research. Um, Okay, and uh, as you can see, um, also our number is working uh, in the um, non-academic uh, research and development area, but, um, and, and this number is slowly decreasing. One of the questions for Germany, of course, will be what will happen within the next years because there are some legal constraints which, um, uh, which will maybe force people to drop out from the academic system within six, seven, eight years after the, uh, the, the graduation. Um, uh, as I've just shown, um, about 40% are working in research development or uh, academic teaching. So this is either academic or industrial research. Um, and you can see um, that, that the incomes are quite high. We have uh, 5,500 euros for those who are working in full time. Um, and we have a lot of um, permanent contracts. but. Um, this differs very much between those two sectors, academic research and industrial research. And um, as you can see, also the wages differ very much, um, and uh, especially persons with fixed term contracts are, are, very, um, are very often in the academic area. So this raises the question, who stays in the academic system? Do we have some problems there, um, especially attracting people to the academic system? And um, uh, as far as we know now from research, um, there are of course some factors that that pull or, or that makes people stay in the academic sector. For example, it's the autonomy. So they have uh, a lot of space and uh, they can decide very much on what they are working in or what they are working on. And also, um, the, the one of the other aspects is the, the, the motivation. A lot of people are very intrinsic motivated. They are very interested in, in the research questions they are working on. And that makes the academic sector um, very attractive. But on the other hand, you just see the differences in the wages and also, of course, in the uh, number of fixed term contracts. <clears throat> um, but uh, when we started that, that survey, um, there was always the question what we heard earlier this, this, um, this morning that um, correlation and causality are not the same, and that may differ. Um, and uh, this was one of the questions we also have. Um, we were not quite sure what kind of experiences during the PhD studies makes people stay in the academic system. Are there experiences that m make people prefer the academic system or even, even leave the academic system? Of course, a lot of people start uh, their PhD with the motivation to stay there or to leave it. But um, also there are factors that might, uh, might um, influence uh, their, their, um, their aims. <clears throat> and therefore we, we started another study which um, uh, started right uh, this year with the first um, a panel wave, which is the NARCAPS. And this is a study um, on PhD students. So we are tracking PhD students now right on um, when, when they are starting their PhD. Um, and we want to uh, follow them for several years so um, that we can see what's going to happen even after the PhD. Um, probably 
So if we are going to succeed, we'll, we'll have some data some 10 years after PhD. Um, and we want uh, also uh, just not to start with a uh, first sample, but we also want to start with the second sample in uh, two years, just to have also the new doctoral candidates into the data set. And um, we are also interested in doing another cohort of graduates, um, which uh, sh shall be surveyed in 2023. The um, number there is, is, is not correct. It's the graduates of 2022. Um, of course, we are um, addressing a lot of topics. I'm not going to, into detail for all these topics now. Um, but you can see we are, we are going uh, to talk about motives and attitudes. We are going to, uh, to talk about what happens during the PhD concerning, for example, the qualification process and um, the scientific work they are, do they are uh, doing there. And of course, we're interested in the outcomes as well. And we're interested in the outcomes, uh, the individual outcomes, but also the, the outcomes for the academic sector and also for society. Um, that means that we want to um, observe the career pathways now already starting during the PhD phases. Um, and um, we, we just finished the first wave. And um, maybe uh, just to tell you that uh, um, we also will be going to um, uh, send uh, to give the data um, to uh, our national report on, on junior scholars, scholars, which is going to be published every fourth year in Germany, and um, we are co cooperating with that project. And these data will, will go to there, and they will have some information on the situation of PhD holders, because in Germany we have the problem that we don't have that much information on that neither on the situation during the PhD or and afterwards. And this is why uh, we are quite interested in this data and also um, everybody else is quite interested in this data. Um, and we hope that we will succeed um, within the no next years because uh, data will become even more uh, interesting when, when people get older and we have longitudinal information on that. Okay, that's for it. Thank you very much. Well, that's been a, a really rich set of information and data. Um, I'm going to start off by linking this back to the discussion on priorities, because what hasn't exactly been formulated as a question is who are we training and why? Um, what are we training our PhD students or our postdocs for? Um, we've heard that maybe we are training too many. How do we know what too many looks like? Um, and if I stay with the UK context, because that's what I understand best, if we are trying to get an uplift in research intensity up to 2.4% of GDP, who do we want in our workforce? And I don't think these are the questions that the UK funders ask. And from what I hear, I don't think it's what any of the other countries funders are asking, what do we need? Um, and what skills do they need? We've heard from various of the speakers that a significant proportion of PhD students then leave. They leave academia, and I hate the fact that many supervisors imply that leaving academia is a failure. Mm. They may go into industry and continue with research. Um, that seems to be, you know, that's obviously good for the knowledge economy. But if they leave any sort of trackable research area, is that still a loss to the knowledge economy? Personally, I think if we had more MPs in this country who had a science PhD, it would be good. So we should not see that as a loss. Um, so I think there are many questions that maybe Rory wants to, to look at, at at this sort of very fundamental level. Again, if I stay within the UK context and build on James's presentation, um, some of the research councils, uh, and I think welcome too, though I'm not so familiar being a physicist, um, have sort of large cohorts of people in a given area. So, for instance, quantum technologies. There's suddenly been a lot of people being trained for PhDs in quantum technologies. Now, from what James says, maybe that's a really bad idea because you're actually then going to have this sort of... Um, social connection and these people will go on and remain socially connected and is that going to lead to crystallization i think was the word you used um so 
we need to think about what is the right way of training our students. Are we better off just distributing them randomly? The emphasis on excellence um, in the language of how decisions are made about where PhD students should go is all very well, but that also comes back to the genealogy argument that I think was implicit in James's talk, that you fund people you already know a lot about. The word this morning that was used was emergent. If we are going to have radical new departures, a paradigm shift, to use Kuhn's phrase, do we need to do radically different things and not just put more in the same places? How are we going to get interdisciplinary research going if we just stay within the silos we already have? So there are many questions that I hope Rory will look into in all kinds of ways. What came through very clearly was the need for better data about what happens to the PhD students who we are training, and better not just in quantitative terms, but I think absolutely in qualitative. If their socioeconomic background makes a difference, we're not going to capture that in our numbers. I mean, you can try and infer that if you are um, in a certain university that isn't traditionally taking lots of people from Eton, then maybe um, your population is more socioeconomically deprived, but that's an inference. You don't have the facts. So we need really good qualitative data about we why people drop out. And on the gender angle, I know we'll have more about that later, but the fact that women are tending to drop out more uh, than, than men, why is that? Is it because they are badly treated or is it the facile argument that they want to go off and have children? I mean, I get so irritated by the number of times I hear that as why women drop out. I think there are much more subtle reasons, including sometimes a very hostile environment, but how many people do exit interviews with their PhD students? So um, the idea of, or the question rather, of what do PhD students think they are doing when they start, I think is also something it would be really good to have data on. About five years ago, I was involved with a project at the Royal Society, setting out what we thought the expectations should be about this sort of background about why you're doing a PhD on the student and the supervisor and the institution. I think many people do start PhDs without having any idea of what they hope to do. If I turn to the international element, um, there was a suggestion we should have um, comparative data across different countries. That would be a really interesting thing to do, but given the scale of what I've just suggested we should do in this country, it's gonna be a massive challenge to do that. Um, but we also, I think, implicit in, in sort of combining some of the presentations, there is the question of does mobility lead to better knowledge sharing? So should we, in any given country, be funding research knowing that the people are going to go back to China or India or wherever it may be and thinking that is really good for the global situation? Or are we going to say, let's be parochial and we only want to try, uh, train our own? So there are many questions I would throw out for Rory. I hope someone's taken some notes as to what they all are because I've given you an awful lot of work to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, we've got about 15 minutes or so for questions, so I'll, we'll, we'll try to take a few at a time. Uh, we've got a microphone here at the front, so may I invite um, questions from the audience, please? Yes. Uh, Richard Nakamura, formerly of the National Institutes of Health. Um, since I'm not part of the organization, I'd like to uh, just ask why did no one mention the importance of getting everyone registered in ORCID in order to get the kind of data that you're looking for? My question is for Professor James Evans. Uh, congratulations first on fitting a lecture course into 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're welcome. <laughs> Can I ask what impact your findings have had on your own institution or any institution around the world? And if the answer is none, uh, what can Rory do about that? Thank you. Shall, shall we start with those? The first one about ORCID registration. 
Um, Megan, perhaps you could take that? Well, I did have, I don't know if it was in the version of the slides that I put up, but at one point I did have that as one of my, you know, what do we need? We need common identifiers across, uh, across researchers. So I absolutely agree with the need for uh, identifiers that allow people to track uh, allow us to track people over time. The research that I talked about was very painstakingly created. We have a database of about 500 uh, scientists in the um, in the Fulbright project, and that was many, many, many hours of carefully uh, looking at data to make sure we had the right match between uh, individuals and their articles. Um, and if we had an ORCID identifier at the time that we were doing that research, it would have been um, much less painful to conduct. So I, I all very much support the idea of common identifiers. Could I just okay. come in? It doesn't really help if people are leaving the no. research landscape completely. Um, it's great for the ones who stay, not so good for the ones who go off to, to do something totally different. Mm -hmm. Can I just throw in one thing too? I think, I mean, uh, you know, I think orchid identification, other identifications are wonderful. Um, in just a little preliminary research that, that my group did, when people basically ship to a different area, they're less likely to describe themselves in a similar or the same way. So I think there's a supply and a demand, essentially, for identification. And there's sometimes in which people are trying to avoid identification with mm -hmm. their prior work. And so mm -hmm. in those cases, I think it'll be difficult for us to, to, us to track because you know, people are trying to obscure that information. But I, but I think absolutely, as a, as a principle, it's a reasonable principle. It's a great principle. Thank you. Shall we go on to the second question, James, for you? So, uh, I, you know, I, I, come on, I'm young. Uh, yes, I'm, you know, uh, wandering around the world trying to persuade funders to, to uh, get interested in these issues. And I would say that certainly the National Science Foundation and the NIH uh, and the Department of Defense have all shown uh, a strong interest in, uh, in taking uh, on board many of these principles. The National Science Foundation in China, uh, who I'm in regular uh, touch with and am in the process of kind of queuing up some experiments, is also uh, extremely interested in, in taking uh, these issues to heart and are you know, designing a set of experiments and, and allowing us access to, to really unique and sensitive data so that we can look at questions surrounding um, review and persistence that, uh, uh, so I think, uh, 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 you know, the first level uh, of demonstration is that uh, funders have increasingly allowed us access to information about things that aren't funded and people that haven't received uh, support, uh, which is absolutely critical for us to, to even think about making causal identification uh, of some of the uh, effects that we're looking at here. So I, I, I take that as a sign of um, support, but I would say a step further um, with decreasing government funds that are allocated and allocatable to uh, to basic research, I think there's a very strong increasing appetite uh, for, uh, for research, um, A, on uh, the way in which funding has gone in the past, and B, on this, di this dis uh, like a disparate diversity of metrics that allow people to identify more than just like the bolus of where papers are going. Uh, which is to say, you know, A, you know, further downstream consumption, the spread of knowledge in particular areas, uh, but also um, uh, innovation and the likelihood that essentially new ideas and disruptive ideas are, are being kind of entered into the, the canon. Um. Thank you, James. Maybe, yeah, maybe just um, on the question as well uh, of the impact on the own institution. I, I cannot recognize um, pretty much um, impact on our own institution, but what I can recognize for Germany especially is that um, uh, people are more aware that most of the PhD students are going to leave the academic system. And this also means that um, the curri curricula are going to change during the PhD phases. Um, there are more offers for, for those who want to leave. Um, uh, career planning is, uh, is an issue, in, uh, in meanwhile, at, at a lot of universities. And therefore, things have changed a little bit. But maybe Rory will find some more ideas what, to what you can do uh, with all this data and all this information. Thank you. Next question. Professor Susanna Sansone, University of Oxford. Thank you very much for your presentation. My question actually is something that I have not heard so far, which is creating actually a career, create a career path for those researchers working in research on research. 
you know, people like myself, which have been working on meta research, data sharing, you know, infrastructure, all the important things to refer to earlier, have had a very hard career path, really uphill. And we are struggling to retain those researchers in our team that work on those areas because they are not recognized as a, as a true academic topic or research topic. There isn't a true career path. A good ex and I wonder if the Rohr Institute will tackle that. And a good example, and I'm closing, it's, for example, the, uh, the, the professionalization of the research software engineer through a society, through their role in building infrastructure for research. Thank you. Thank you. Another question? Hi, I'm Adam. I'm a program manager at the Wellcome Trust and now at Rory. Uh, my question doesn't come from me. It's actually our first question that's been submitted anonymously via Slido today. Um, so I'll try and do it justice. It, it asks, to what extent do we have data that allows us to tell whether the humanities are subject to the same biases as the life sciences? And depending on what the answer to that is, can we apply the same kind of management and support strategies to the humanities as we can to the life sciences in thinking about careers? Thank you very much. So, so the first question about career paths for researchers on research. Um, Sally, can I turn to you for that? I think it's a really important question um, and perhaps one that um, plays out slightly differently in different national contexts. So speaking as a researcher in the UK, um, I think there is quite a vibrant community around higher education research, which is, as we've heard this morning, where much of these empirical studies are located. Um, and perhaps thinking more about the continent, there is um, perhaps a stronger tradition in sociological studies of science. Um, so they would be my kind of initial impressions um, towards that question. But I think it's a really important issue to raise. Thank you. Can I mention just one thing here? I think, um, I think you know, it's exciting the support here and the support increasingly around the world. At the same time, I think um, it, it's it's also one of those areas where it would be easy to kind of pick a winner, you know, pick a nut, pick pick our second metric or our third metric, or or um, you know, build uh, tight communities that essentially kill um, what I would say is really exciting kind of ferment of different perspectives that are really emerging in the context of the science of science. So I think it's it would be great to institutionalize some things, but it would be uh, you know unfortunate if we inst institutionalize too much. Thank you. Good. Um, the next question was about uh, disciplinary variation in arts and humanities versus, versus life sciences. Who would like to have a go at that one? I think. <laughs> so I think certainly in this country the statistics would be less good. We have fewer uh, PhD students in those subjects. But it comes back to what I said about we really need the qualitative data because that would start to, to capture whether the experiences they have are different. And there was a very interesting piece of work that I think Wellcome was involved with some years ago comparing chemistry PhD and biochemistry PhDs which are very closely allied. And yet the experiences in those two disciplines were markedly different, particularly when it came to gender. So I think one really needs to drill down into a lot of the data to see if there are significant differences. Maybe, maybe I can add on that. Um, uh, labor markets change very much between the different disciplines. And therefore, um, you have, of course, you have to take a look into all that. But um, also, the PhD situation, uh, the situation during the PhD differs a lot between the different uh, subjects. And <clears throat> therefore, um, I think it's very, very important to have a look into that. And Sally just showed it, showed it and we have the sh same in Germany. In the humanities, uh, even more people stay. Uh, in the academic sector than uh, in other subjects. The question is, why is that so? Uh, is it just because uh, of the labor market situation? Is it maybe because they are more intrinsic motivated and more interested in research questions? And this is uh, how uh, the field or the questions we should elaborate on, because that's not quite, quite clear up to now. What happens during the PhD? What is the labor market? And what are the outcomes? Uh, who stays? Why? And uh, therefore, of course, you have to take into account the dis uh, uh, several disciplines. Can I, mention, can I mention just one thing? I would say all the the, the kind of the broad effects that uh, we find in terms of you know team size and and likelihood of persistence and and all those things are true across the humanities in relatively uh, the same way. The thing that's different or one of the things that's different is that the humanities, if we're talking about really in terms of global scope, means something very different across countries. 
uh, and this is something, so something, you know, so what is humanities research uh, in a number of African countries doesn't look like or is perceived as the same thing as humanities research in other places. And if you look at the entropy across, so I looked at OCLC library holdings, there's about 85,000 libraries, um, that, you know, humanities uh, research, but also, you know, the, the basically kind of poetic and, and literature outputs are the most local effectively because you know they're fundamentally kind of tied into those locales and places. So I think they actually face a much uh, different and greater challenge. Uh, certainly like the cross-national issue is, uh, I mean, there's very little demand essentially for poets from one language culture in another and that, that, that dramatically changes the impact and demand for those skills. So. Thank you, James. Okay, next question. Hello, uh, I'm Nick Campbell from Spring of Nature. Um, so I was struck by the, uh, the call from a couple of you about that we need more data about, the, about the, uh, this group that goes on uh, out of academia. And that seems a really fascinating thing to say because you know, it's graduate students and, and, and to some, some extent postdocs that are generating most of the data that underpins the whole scientific system, if you, if you like. And we don't know much about the majority of those people who go on to other careers. And, and another big issue is, of course, understanding the value they deliver through their subsequent careers is a really important part of the value that funders deliver, uh, you know, return on investment from funders. Um, and so I'm interested, is there a lot of research going on in that area, trying to measure the value that non-academic, uh, uh, you know, destined uh, researchers provide subsequent to their, their generating most of the data we rely on to actually move the whole ecosystem forward? Thank you very much for that question. Um, that could be answered by several words. Um, Sally? Sure. Um, so I can speak uh, to the UK context on that. Um, the data that I showed in my presentation is really the most comprehensive data we have. That's through the Destinations of Leavers of Higher Education survey, which is not a survey that was designed for PhD graduates. It's a survey that was designed for first degree graduates. So many of the questions aren't particularly appropriate to understanding that kind of return on investment. Um, and if we look at particularly at those who leave academia, what we lack there is um, a, a standard classification of what doctoral level work might look like in uh, non-academic sectors. Um, so again, it's really hard to, using existing data, try to capture that return on investment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There's a question uh, in the audience. Oh, thank Hi. You. Yes. Is this on? Yes. Hi, Francesco Bino from the Global Development Network. Um, I wonder whether we are conflating the objective, if, including in terms of productivity and evaluation, of PhD programs with uh, research capacity and research, and research training. Here we, we're talking a lot about you know, what PhDs do at the end of a PhD, but we're talking much less about what research capacity is supposed to do. And, and why we get into research, uh, in particular I'm talking about the, the, the social sciences, for example. Um, on one hand, we, we, we expect so much from research in terms of impact on policy, impact on development, impact on everything. But then when we go back to capacity of, of academics, it seems that the only thing that matters is actually scientific productivity. So maybe we should take a broader uh, look at research capacity and, 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 and somehow remember you know, what research capacity is supposed to do. You know, answer questions, that, you know, not just being cited, citing and, and, and writing um, in international peer-reviewed articles. And then I think the broad range of career paths and options uh, would, um, would be easier to, to understand, including across countries, obviously, because a PhD from a, from a top university in, in, a, in a global north kind of country uh, the value it has in that global north or the value it has in, in, in the original country where the person uh, might have come from is very different. So you, you might have a PhD from you know, a top university in the US who goes back to um, a developing country where he or she comes from and become a dean uh, straight away in a private or public university. Obviously, you wouldn't have that in the US. You know? <laughs> Nobody gets a PhD and then becomes automatically a dean. Right? So uh, maybe we should go back to why, why we get research training and, and, and what that, the value of that title, how it travels as well, to understand better what, what we're producing, really. Thank you. Thank you. That's certainly a question that, 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 that's relevant to your systems approach to, to, to the problem, James. But I'll, I'd like to ask Megan, perhaps, first for a comment. 
I just have to say uh, that I agree. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, of course, I think we're all guilty, or I will say I'm guilty of the phenomenon of looking for the keys under the lamppost, which was uh, mentioned uh, earlier, which is that we measure the things that we have easy access to data on. So, um, I mean, one of the things that we certainly thought about when we were doing the Fulbright research was how great it would be to um, collect information on just what you say, you know, how many people are serving as deans or leading, uh, you know, I saw, looking at the biographies of these people who went back to their home countries, I saw lots of people leading institutes or being involved in technology transfer from universities and so on and so forth, and that those sort of activities are very difficult to measure in a systematic way across fields, across countries, and so on, but I agree with you that, um, you know, that may be a topic for another paper, which is a more qualitative analysis of some of these impacts. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. James, final point? Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, I think, I mean, I, I think at one level, um, I, um, I think certainly actually looking deeper uh, than just PhDs, you know, looking into education and masters and undergraduate levels and the impact of different scientific exposures has basically on problem solving and advance in a number of different areas is, is critical. And, and we've been kind of pushing into a kind of a science of skill that allows us to, to think about that. But I would also kind of open the question, uh, you know, uh, really kind of back to you. I mean, we may think that we know what the impact of, you know, someone with a scientific background, a PhD, on being a dean or being an MP or being a something else. Um, but I think that's, that's very much a question, right? So it's not obvious. Like, we don't know what the, the relative, I mean, in many cases, it could be that it's a dead weight loss. It could be that we're actually spending a lot of, you know, the prime years of uh, a young person's life on an investment that is a terrible investment for society and a, as a person. So the idea that, you know, we know the answer to this question, it feels like we're the economics of sports, you know, like find, trying to find, you know, like a huge figure that compensates for all of our investment in the Olympics, you know, in a certain city or whatever. Um, whereas I just, I just I mean, this, is a, this is a question that we should be critical about when we're thinking about how to spend our, our our funding on education. Thank you very much. It's gone just past one o'clock. Um, one, one more there. We can take that, I'm sure. Yeah, hey, um, I'm George Richardson. I work at Nesta. Um, I guess I some of the some of the, the framing around around this sometimes feels slightly colonial. In you know, it's um, how much how much of this the of people can we bring in and train up and then retain. Um, and I guess I wonder, um, you know, particularly in, de in developed economies, and I wonder is that is that really a framing that is useful when we're talking about a research and research institute, and we heard before about kind of the global challenges that we need to be tackling, it, is that still a kind of a language that we want to be using, or is that just something that we have to say because that's what ministers like to hear? Thank you. Um, I think I turn to you. <laughs> <laughs> you can have the final word again. <laughs> so I think um, if that's the framing, I don't think anyone on the panel would have intended it to be. But it, it comes back to what data can we get? And if we don't understand a system that's quite developed, and we clearly don't, then we're not going to be very useful anywhere else. I mean, I raised the point about you know what happens when people go back to China or India. Is that a plus or a minus? And I think... Um, you know, that is certainly something that could be asked. But since we can't work out what the value is in any single country, it's even more challenging to answer it in that, in that context. Good. Well, that leaves me just with um, warm words of thanks to you for, for engaging in this session. Um, I thought it was very interesting, and, and, and we've covered a huge amount of, of ground, which is great to see. Um, and I hope you'll join me in thanking our speakers and the discussion. Thank you very much.